Colossians chapter 4. And uh, if I have not had the privilege of meeting you, I am the associational missionary. It's a partnership of about 50 churches in the four counties that are around us here, all the way over almost to Prescott, up to Camden, Magnolia, Hampton, on down around through New London, Strong, Junction City, and on around the border, Three Creeks. So uh, we have a good, strong area association that we partner together, just like your church. You pray, uh, you participate, you give, and uh, you take part in what God's doing at this, this local level of churches just working together to reach the uh, people in your area for the kingdom. And there's some exciting things going on. You've already mentioned this morning the, the uh, food pantry there in El Dorado, and we have one in Camden. But I was in a meeting this week, and this year we have given out over $10,000 worth of just food to people who need it, people who stop by who have need. This is because of your church and churches like it, where we just help one family at a time as they have needs, and sometimes it's utilities, sometimes it's helping them with, with gas to go somewhere to get a job. And so I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for your partnership. In January, we're having a, a senior adult event. If you've not heard yet, it's uh, I believe it's the second Thursday of January. <laughs> And we're having a, an old-fashioned kind of a homecoming singing, a hymn singing. We're having a brunch. I believe it's January the 11th. And uh, so I hope you can, some of you can join us there. It's $5. It'll be a great meal. It starts at 10 o'clock. And all of our senior adults are invited. It's at the camp up here that we have up uh, just north of El Dorado on the way toward Camden. And then in February... I believe it's February 9th and 10th. It's one of the it's the second weekend there in February on a Friday and Saturday. We're having a great it's a South Arkansas student retreat, and so we encourage all of our youth. If y'all aren't doing anything uh, that weekend, there is a great retreat at the camp. It's February the 9th and 10th, and it'll be an exciting time. A lot of area churches are taking part, so I want to personally invite you to consider being a part of that time. In Galatians chapter 4. Uh, we have a passage in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, what I want to focus in on this morning. And very quickly, I want to talk to you about the times of Christmas. The times of Christmas. You see, one of the things I realize the older I get is that, uh, you know, I, I look back over my shoulder and I can see all the things that have gone on in my life and my family and people that are no longer here, the, the joyful times and the difficult times. And as my life moves forward, and now my kids are out of, out of uh, the house, we are empty nesters. I have one at Washita and one at the University of Arkansas uh, Law School that just started. And so we are, you know, we're looking forward. My, my parents are aging. My kids are moving on. And so we're doing a lot of evaluating about our time and, and you know, our family. And, you know, one of the things I've come to realize in the last year or two is life is just not the big picture. Life is just these moments, uh, it's made up of these snapshots. And you, and you can't let the big picture overwhelm you because you have to learn to enjoy those moments. If you get so caught up in, well, I, I wish it was like it was back whenever. Uh, I, I wish so-and-so was still around. I can't be happy because uh, the, these folks have moved on. They're, they're not with us anymore. We have to learn to, to enjoy every moment of our life because life is made of moments. And, 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 you know, we can look back at the big picture. One of the things about Christmas and the timing of Christmas is God gives us these glimpses of not just the moment, but he gives us the big picture too. And I want to illustrate that this morning by looking at these two primary passages of Scripture. Now, we've already heard from Luke 2, all right? Uh, in, the, in the Advent candle, uh, um, we, we heard from Luke 2. We, we know the events of Christmas. We, we know what happened at, at the Nativity. We know in Luke 2 that, that God called Mary and, and said, you're going to have a child, and it was a total surprise. And yet, at the same time, in Galatians chapter 4, we see not just the details, but we see the big picture. In Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those that were under the law, that, might, that we might receive the adoption as sons. I can't think of a better passage. When I, if I get frustrated about the way things are going on and the timing in my life, 
I can't think of a better time of the year to, to learn to trust in God's timing than Christmas. Because in many ways, for some people, Christmas was not the best time. Now you think about the people that took part in that first Christmas. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes, there's a time appointed under heaven for everything. There, that, that famous passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a time for every event under heaven. And, and so we, we, we ought to trust God. He's made everything appropriate in its own time. But what does the Bible tell us about God's timing? I, I want you to think first of all in this passage about the Christmas from Mary's viewpoint. She's like us sometimes. You know, if you, if you think about just the, from her vantage point, when you think about all that was going on in her life, there were several reasons I can think of why it might not have been the best time to, to, to bring Jesus into the world. I, I think about four or five things. Think first and foremost about the fact of the awkwardness of whatever it was her relationship with Joseph was. Now we can, you know, we can... Talk about, you know, she, uh, he was, they were betrothed. Certainly it was different. If you go to different cultures, I travel to India a lot, and, and, and you know, marriage in other cultures is more of an ongoing process. We have these punctiliar moments. We have uh, engagement, and then we have the marriage, you know. Well, in other cultures, it's different, and we, and we don't really understand this. Yesterday I was in New Orleans, and uh, we were having a big family event, and I, I uh, finished my, my doctoral program back in the spring, and actually had the ceremony yesterday, so we went to this big lunch, and we were eating there, and uh, my uh, daughter's boyfriend, she's been going with him for about two years, and I figure there's probably a, a future there, but he was asking what he should call my, uh, who is my father-in-law, if he should call him, uh, you know, Papa or father-in-law, we said, no, it's not time for you to call him that yet. You know, y'all aren't engaged and, and give it some more time. And so it's like, well, we think it's going to happen, but not yet. There was this awkwardness to their relationship. And, and yet, uh, you know, the, we, we call it betrothed. It, for certain, it wasn't complete. And so there would have been a lot of questions. Well, how in the world did Mary get pregnant? I mean, this, this is awkward, especially in that legalistic culture where maybe they would, it might have you know, cost her her life, or certainly they would have been ostracized. And so uh, if you think about just the awkwardness of the timing of that relationship, and, and, the, and yet a second point here we see is that the birth was going to take place at a time in the land where uh, you know, the Romans were there. It was a very difficult time. They had, they had to move to another city because of the census. Remember that? And so they, it, you know, they had to move from... from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem and it was just over and over and all, all the things that were taking place it was a very difficult time the census interrupted their life and, and when you, and some of you that travel and you have small kids you know when, when our kids were little and, and I don't know how folks do it these days you know everybody has kids and then the next generation they, they tell you why you didn't do it right right and you've got all the things that you're supposed to do you're not supposed to lay them on their back or you're not supposed to do this and you're not supposed to feed them this you know we had all these rules that we laid out for my, my parents whenever we, because we, we were smarter than my parents were. And so we, we told them, you know, what they can eat in this age. And, and the first time we left my kids, our kids with uh, my parents, we came in and they were eating spaghetti and, you know, corn and everything. And they were, you know, four months old and we hadn't even started them on these other foods. So, you know, it didn't kill them either, did it? So... But you know, these days you got and, and every, you got all these things you got to bring. You got to bring the bottle warmers, and you got to bring the diaper genies, and you got to bring all these things. I don't know how people pack to go on trips with kids anymore. And so, uh, yeah, I, I have no idea. So when you think about even in their day, there would have been no support system. She's gone to this strange place, and and they're going to have a baby. And and the housing situation. We know the story about how they went to the inn, and there was no room in the inn, and how they the the awkwardness of just the timing. From Mary's vantage point, it would, it, you know, she would say, God, why now? It just doesn't seem to be the right time. Have you ever had that happen in your life? Not, not about this, but I'm just talking about, Lord, why? Why now? Why me? This is, this is difficult. And so for many, many of us in our lives, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. I remember this game show that was on TV years ago where they, 
they showed these pieces of a puzzle and then after a few moments another piece of the puzzle would pop up and eventually whoever won on the, on the program was the one that could figure out what the puzzle was by just seeing a few of the pieces that were up there. And you know, in many ways, that's the way life is. Sometimes in God's sovereignty, He only gives us a few pieces of the puzzle. We don't have to have it all figured out in order to, to learn to trust Him and know, you know what, I don't have to understand everything in life. God is in charge, and I can learn to trust Him. So, so from Mary's vantage point, it might have been a very difficult time for, for whatever took place at Christmas. But let me give you two more perspectives. I love that, that worship video right before uh, the Advent candle uh, during the offering because it talked about some of the things I want to look at. It talked about Christmas in light of, of prophecy. I want to, I want to look at Christmas from two other viewpoints before I close. Think about the hope of all of Israel for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. The promise that God was going to bring a deliverer, a Messiah. And when you think about Christmas in light of the prophecies from the Old Testament, well, the time was perfect. I mean, God couldn't have nailed it any better. First of all, in the Old Testament, they promised that this Messiah would come and he would emerge victorious. From the moment that our forefathers in the garden first rebelled against God and sin came in the world and the curse was placed upon them, from that moment forward, though, God promised that I'm going to crush the head of the serpent. God had a plan, didn't he? And God was working on that plan even when man couldn't see it. And so we can trust that even in this moment, God says, listen, don't worry, I've got a plan. And prophet after prophet reminded us that God was in control. There was a second thing that God promised. He also promised that the Messiah was going to come through the nation of Israel. You ever wonder why the nation of Israel was selected? You ever wonder why God plucked a man named Abraham and pulled him out of those moon-worshipping people in the, in the Fertile Crescent and called him over to, to the Holy Land and said, Abraham, just follow me. Just trust me. God put his hand upon him because through through Abraham and through Israel, eventually, God would bring the Messiah. He also promised that it would come through the tribe of Judah, didn't he? He's getting a little more specific here. He said not only would it be through Israel, but it's going to be through one of these tribes, the tribe of Judah. In fact, at one point, one of the, 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 the dad was prophesying over his sons, and he came and he called forth that fourth son, Judah. And he, when he brought him in there, he told Judah, he said, the scepter will never be taken out of your hand. And you know what he was prophesying? You're gonna, one of your descendants is going to be not just a king, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so the Messiah would come not only from the Israel and not only from the tribe of Judah, but the Messiah would also come from the house of David. See, David was part of that tribe, but he, the Messiah was also going to come through David. See, David wanted to build the temple back in his day, didn't he? He wanted to build a great edifice, a great building for God. And yet God said, that's not for you to do. That's going to be for Solomon. But God says, I'll tell you what's going to happen, David. From your house, from your lineage, the Messiah will come. And so that's exactly what happened. That's why when you read the beginning of Matthew and when you read the beginning of Luke, you read those genealogies of Jesus, it's a reminder that God is fulfilling his prophecy through these lines of David and Judah and Israel. A couple of more things, and we could go on and on. There's so many prophecies. The prophecy that he would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. It was no accident that that's exactly how he came into this world. It was prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah, the prophet in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Micah said, But thou, Bethlehem, out of these shall come forth one who is to become the ruler of Israel. It was prophesied over and over. We can go to so many things this morning. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that wise men would visit him. Over and over, all of these things were prophesied. But from the Old Testament viewpoint, this was perfect timing. But I want you to think about history. I want you to think about, even if you weren't familiar with what was going on in the Old Testament, the prophecies, I want you to think about what was going on in history at the time of Jesus' birth. Some things that, that we look back now, and maybe they didn't understand it. When, when Paul said, in the, look at Galatians 4, in the fullness of time. What does that mean? Prophecy looked forward to the birth of Jesus. 
But in history, there was something that was taking place at that moment. Five things, very quickly, and then we'll have our invitation. Five things that were taking place that would make this the perfect time. Number one, God's people, the Jews, had been spread out all across the, the land. They were, they were spread out all, all across that land around the Mediterranean. You know, we're, we're living in a day, I think in, in 100 years or 200 years, people are going to look back and they're going to see that this is a, a day of, my, uh, of intense migrations and upheavals. We've already seen uh, in the last couple of years people that are getting on boats from northern Africa, floating across to Europe. We've seen the debate in Europe about do we take in these folks or not? Even here in America, we've got debates about different cultures that are, you know, right or wrong. With different cultures, do are we going to lose, you know, a unique, you know, back in the days where Indians were here, that was a debate they had, you know, they were having. Do, do we hold our land? Do we? And it's on all through history. This has been taking place. And back in the old, back in the time of the new, between the old and new testament, they have this thing called the diaspora of the Jews. They were spread out. Because of persecution, they were sent all over. Do you realize at the time of the birth of Jesus, there were about a million Jews in Egypt alone? Now, because of the spread of Islam, you'd be lucky to find a handful of them because they don't get along very well. And, and so, you know, there's a lot going on in the news these days about, well, is Jerusalem the capital of, you know, they've been fighting over there for millennia. So, that's just the, but but there's there was this event that took place where all of these Jews, these God fearers that, that believed in one God, God of the Old Testament, all, they were spread around. And so guess what happened? When Jesus came, and people began to believe he was the Messiah, and they Paul and others began to go out. There were these hotbeds of evangelism that people could go, and you can. What did Paul do? He would go into what a synagogue, wouldn't he? And he would share. He would go and find people who already knew that there was one God and that he was going to send a Messiah. And he would say, listen, I know the name of that Messiah. It's Jesus Christ. So there were Jewish people spread out all across the, the Mediterranean area. Made it a perfect place to start the new church. Number two, there was also a favorable uh, legal system. You say, well, well, what do you mean by that? Listen, as the Roman Empire spread... It, uh, it would conquer different peoples and it would, it would force them to, to agree, listen, you've got to bow down to Caesar. You've got to say that Caesar is Lord. And as they would conquer these different peoples from Africa, you do realize the Romans went all the way to Britain at the time, uh, maybe a couple hundred years after the time of Christ, that there are records of them going all the way to Britain. That was about as far as, but I mean, they were going all over Europe and they were conquering these lands. And as they would go, they would force them to bow to Caesar. But there was one group of people that, that refused to do it, and that was the Jews. The Jews said, we're not going to do it. And, and, they, and they kept having rebellion after rebellion. And finally, they gave in and said, okay, we're going to make an exception for the Jewish people. And, and so after decades of trying to get the Jewish people to bow to, to the Caesars, they said, okay, we're going to make an exception for you. And, and so at the time of Jesus, when new believers started emerging, the Romans couldn't tell the difference between uh, the early Christians and the Jews. And, and for the first 60 or 70 years, they couldn't tell the difference. And by then it was too late. Christianity had already spread enough that it had had a foothold in the empire. And so it was a favorable legal environment. Number three, there was also a favorable political climate. You say, well, what do you mean? There was a favorable political climate. Some of, some of you teenagers that are watching the news and you're paying attention to what's happening with politics right now, and if this is your first rodeo as far as uh, either elections or press, listen, these are, these are uh, almost unprecedented times we're living in. And, and you know, you, I don't know about you, but I've got people I can talk to politics about, I can't talk politics about, people get mad. Whoever you voted for, yay or nay, you know. I remember a time where you could dis. I remember times where my mom and dad could vote for different candidates for president, and that just that's just the way it was, you know. People vote different, and you just decide. And, and yet we're we're living in a time where even in America, political conversations are very intense, and 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 it seems like we're very divided, you know. And some of you some of you remember times where it wasn't like that. It was just sort of. 
and, it, and you, know, you had differences and there were policy differences or your approach to how you believed with the role of government or not government and, and we, we did it, we voted, we moved on. But it's, we're living in a very intense political and, and I hope that, that very soon we can get back to where we just go out and exercise our civic duty to vote and we move on and that's it. But that's not what, what's taking place right now. But let me tell you, in this environment, there was a very favorable political environment in that for several hundred years after the time, some of you remember the, the play, um, Julius Caesar. Remember that play? And he was, remember he was assassinated at, at the end of it? And you know what they did with their leader? They would, they would assassinate their leader. They would overthrow him and different Roman leaders would fight and all. And, and that happened for years and years until before the time of Jesus, all of a sudden, about, about 25 years before Jesus was born, peace broke out among the Roman Empire. We call, it, we call it the Pax Romana. It was a peaceful time. And for whatever reason, I think it's God's timing, there was a, time, there was a period of relative peace, and so people could go about safely, uh, travel, they could go about and, and you know, literally uh, go from place to place. And so that's exactly what happened at the time that Jesus was born. Let me make a couple of other comments before I close. There was also a favorable cultural environment. There was a favorable cultural environment. You say, well, what do you mean? As uh, before the Romans, remember the Greeks were in, uh, Alexander the Great. And as Alexander the Great would go, now he went all the way almost to India, all right, toward the east. And as Alexander, the Greek empire, would conquer lands, guess what he would do? They would, the folks would learn the language Greek. You ever wonder why the New Testament was in Greek? And so that was the common language. Right now what we're seeing is uh, when I go to India, the places I go in India, there are 1,500 languages in India, all right? And when I go to India... We, uh, in, in the distance where I drove this morning from El Dorado to come over here, you might go drive through areas where there are three different languages. So if I'm over there doing evangelism, I have to have three separate boxes of Bibles, and I have to know, am I in an area where they speak Telugu, Tamil, or Kannada? And, and, and so, because it's just, a, it's just an awkward, it's, a, it's difficult. And yet at the time of the New Testament, Greek, was the language of the empire, not just the Palestine, but it was the language of the empire. And so, you know, today, if the New Testament had been written today, Galatians and Ephesians would be written in Turkish. Corinthians and Thessalonians would be in Greek, and Romans would be written in Italian. And the book of Hebrews would, of course, be in Hebrew. So, but, but in that day, it was all written in this common language where people all over could understand it, and all of a sudden, the word of the gospel could get out. And when I think about Christmas, and when I think about the awkwardness, and next Sunday when you get together and you read about, you know, for Mary it was difficult, and she had to go out into the manger and have the baby, and all of this and that, and it's just, a, I want you to be reminded of this verse, but when the fullness of time had come, it was the perfect timing. See, you and I don't always understand God's timing. But we can trust His timing. And I'm telling you, there are things, there are things this year in my life that hit my life that, that I think, God, why in the world would this ever happen? Lord, I, I love you. I'm your servant. And yet, when I think about the things that happen, I can always say, Lord, regardless of what comes into my life, I'm going to choose to trust you. God, your timing is always perfect. Christopher Columbus was frustrated because he knew that there was more out there than other sailors were saying. He was frustrated and one day he walked by a monastery and he was thirsty so he walked in this monastery and he asked one of the monks for a drink. And as he was sitting there he told this monk his story and why he was so frustrated. Well guess what? He didn't know that that monk was personal friends with Queen Isabella. And he went and he talked to the queen and convinced her to finance the expedition of Christopher Columbus. Now the world was changed because of that, but it all started because of the, of the timing of being at the right place in the right time. Abraham Lincoln was frustrated with his life. He was a very poor person, very backward person. And one day in the back of his store, he was rummaging through an old barrel 
And he was looking through this stuff, looking for stuff to sell, maybe make a little bit more money. He was so frustrated, barely making it. And he reached down and he felt a couple of books. And when he pulled them up, he saw that they were called, they were called Blackstone's Commentaries. And something about those two books sort of whetted his appetite. He began to read it, and eventually he began to study law, and he got into politics, and of course we know the rest of the story. He became president of the United States and a healer of our union during the time of the Civil War. It all started with rummaging through an old barrel. Circumstances? Coincidence? I tell you, the Bible teaches me that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And we can trust God. Even in those ordinary moments, we can trust God. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me. We're going to close our service in a moment. We're going to sing a song of invitation. But, but let me tell you something I've learned in my short time here on this planet. Listen, nothing ever stays the same. Moments come and moments go. Doors open and doors close. Things that are optional today become non-negotiable tomorrow. The Bible tells us, seek the Lord while he may be found. And you know what? If Mary, I think if Jesus' mother, I think if Mary were here and you were to ask her, you were to look at her and talk to her and say, look, talk about, tell me about what's going on. I think Mary would say, you know, if there's anything I've learned about Christmas, it's when God speaks, don't miss the moment. Nothing stays the same. And your, your heads are bowed this morning. And you know what? God has a marvelous sense of timing. And for some of you, you didn't, you didn't realize you were going to come in and there was going to be a guest pastor and he's speaking on the time. Of, but you don't know exactly what God's saying to your heart today. All of a sudden, there are things in your life that just don't make sense. Nobody knows what's going on. But, but, but you're questioning and you're wondering. And today God brought you here to remind me, to remind you that, you know what? God is still in control. And you need to learn to trust him. You need, just need to put it into his hand. You don't see the big picture. But God, help me to trust you. Help me to let it go. Lord, forgive me for worrying and fretting and doubting. Some of you that are here today, you would say, you know what, Brother Ernest? God's reaching out to me and I've, I've never opened my heart to him. I've never... Ask him to be my savior. He's not my shepherd. He's not my Lord. And so if I were real honest today, that would be the thing I would need to do is realize I've never taken advantage of God's invitation to be my heavenly father. And so right now, just in these moments, here's what I want to ask you to do. Next week's going to be Christmas, but, but what a great time in your life to just say, you know what, Lord, I want you to come in my life. I want you to be my savior, to be my master, my Lord. Lord, I want you to forgive me for everything I've done wrong. And I want you to be my Savior. And God, today, I, as much as I know about you, I embrace you. And I ask you to be my, my master and my Savior from this day forward. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now, I'm going to ask you as we stand together, you can sing or you can keep your head bowed. But I'm going to be at the front. We're going to sing the song softly and tenderly. But as the Lord speaks to your heart, if there's a spiritual decision that you need to make, I would love to.